Hi class, welcome to Introduction to the Middle East. I hope you enjoyed our last lesson on Jordan. Today, as you know, we get to talk about terrorism. We get to talk about the fundamentalist ideologies behind terrorism. And to start out today's lesson, I want to show you a video and I want you to think of what, what's one word that describes how this makes you feel. And, and, and also, why, why would this happen? What, what would go through someone's mind that would do this? I took an express subway train from Times Square to Chamber Street, which is the stop just before the World Trade Center. The first thing I saw was the two World Trade Centers. Both of them had smoke and fire coming from them. I just started making my pictures. I was photographing the burning building when EMT says, oh my gosh, look at that. And we started seeing people coming down out of the building. I instinctively picked up my camera and started photographing them, following them as they came down. Until I photographed what must become known as the falling man. It's a very quiet photograph. It's not like a lot of other violent photographs from other disasters. There's no blood, there's no guts, there's nobody getting shot. But people react to it in a way that they feel that they can relate to this photograph. That they might have been in the same situation and they might have had to make whatever choice the man in the photograph made. You have to be very aware of your surroundings when you're in a situation like this. You have to be careful that you don't become a victim. Journalists don't run away from a falling building. We don't run away from the fire. We run to it because it's our job to record history. I didn't know I had that photograph of that man in that position until I actually saw it on my computer when I got back to the office. I called one of our photo editors and I showed him the picture and I said, I, this is it. This has got to be the picture. This man was like an arrow bisecting the two World Trade Centers. I woke up the next morning and I opened up the paper and there was my photograph of Falling Man. It was a very brave thing for them to use that picture. It was the only picture that was like that of anybody falling from the building. The only picture that showed any kind of human interaction like that. A paper in Allentown, Pennsylvania used the picture and they put it on their whole back page in the newspaper and then the editor said that it was that important to photograph and he got a lot of mail, letters to the editor saying, you shouldn't have run this, this is not something I want my children to see. Tom Janot, the author of the Esquire article, he's the one who came up with the name The Falling Man. That was the name of the article and it sort of stuck. I've never regretted taking that photograph at all. It's probably one of the only photographs that actually shows someone dying that day. We have a terrorist attack on our own soil and we still don't see pictures of our people dying and this is a photograph of someone dying. What, what kind of mindset, belief system, uh, ideology would motivate someone to kill thousands of innocent victims? 
This same group, Al Qaeda, they they had a, a magazine, online magazine called Inspired, Inspire of all words to call it, and uh, just show you a, a few articles inside of this one particular issue. As you can see here, this one article is talking about targeting transportation, taking out the lifeblood of the civil war civil world, it's transportation. And, and in this article, they talk about three things that should be targeted. Uh, a vehicle itself that's used for transportation, uh, the line of transport, the pathway, like a train track, stations, terminals, transit points. And then there was another article on how uh, the article classified disbelievers into different categories and points out which ones you should seek to kill first among civilians. I'm assuming those red bags right there are supposed to be bombs, but I'm not sure. Uh, there was another article uh, uh, talking about American raids in Yemen. And they showed this soldier in the middle that was labeled as a hero for killing children and participating in fruitless raids. He, I assume, I'm not sure if he was Saudi or American, but they're definitely, I think it was American because you look on the left there, it says the Americans killed her father, Sheikh Anwar al-Walaki. And they're trying to justify their jihad against America because we were, we, and we were part of some of the bombings in Yemen against some al-Qaeda groups. But the most intriguing article was the main article. And the whole article was about how to derail trains. And for example, this particular, they start out by showing you how a train functions on the track. And, and, they, and then they'll, if you zoom in, they'll show uh, how you, the track management teams will derail a runaway train. And so they'll show what the uh, track management teams will do. So what they do is they say in this article is, hey, if they can do it, we can too. So let me show you how to do it at home in your garage. And show so they show you how to make this device that will derail a train. And they go step by step. All these things you can buy down at Home Depot. Very interesting, huh? Well, that was Al-Qaeda's magazine. Um, ISIS will eventually, when they come out later in 2014, uh, they will have a magazine called Dabiq. And uh, it was the... Um, it was published first in 2014, July 2014, and uh, it was published via the deep web. And although, you know, it was only it was widely available um, through other online sources, not just the deep web. But according to the magazine, its name, Dabiq, it, that comes from a town in northern Syria, which is mentioned in a hadith um, that that talks about Armageddon. And I so believed that Dabiq is where Muslim and infidel forces will eventually, they'll come and they'll face each other. And after, um, after ISIL will defeat the crusader forces, the infidels, the apocalypse will begin. And uh, they only made 15 issues. It went from 2014 to 2016. But again, my question is, where does this kind of mindset originate? Well, um, uh, is in Islam, they would say shaitan, and in English, they would say Satan. That's where it comes from. And uh, what's sad about this is that so many, um, this is just another example of someone who thinks they're doing right when they're under the influence of wrong, of evil. In fact, the prophet Joseph Smith said, nothing is greater is a greater injury to the children of men than to be under the influence of a false spirit when they think they have the spirit of God. Karen Strong, in her article, The Battle for God, she says, the hideous 9-11 attack shows that when people begin to use religion to justify a hatred and killing and thus abandon the compassionate ethic of all the great world religions, they have em embarked on a course that represents a defeat for faith. And I think what happens is, I think the principle I, I would like to teach is, is it's important that one of the things, when I say Satan's behind this, one of the things he does is he tries to get us to go either too far to the left or too far to the right. For example, in our own church, there are people uh, that will go, they'll, they'll leave the mainstream of, of the doctrines of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, and they'll go far to the left, 
and and and, and I'm not they're not now don't I'm not saying they go to the left and kill people, but there's some people go far to the, will go far to the left and say, hey, I, I they'll they, they'll feel like hey, it's not enough to have the to enjoy the powers of the priesthood. Um, some women said, I want the priesthood. I demand the priesthood, not just men should have the priesthood. And then you have some that, that left the church uh, because they wanted to practice plural marriage when our prophet of God said the Lord has stopped that practice. And so, um, but if taken to the extreme, you take uh, any kind of any kind of religion and you go too far one way, it hurts. And in the case of Islam, and even in the case of Christianity, when taken too far, it can be very, very dangerous. Not just in, uh, not just doctrinally, but it can actually hurt people around them. Let me let me give an example of this. Um, so let me talk a little bit about militant Islam and how it's gone too far to the right. So Islam, like most great world religions, it's been a, a quietist religion for most of its history. Now, not always, but mostly. And what is meant by the term quietist is, is quietist is basically how you deal with sin in your world. To live a quietist life, live your religion quietly, peacefully. It's between you and God. But so, but maybe you're surrounded by sinners. How do you deal with it? Well, some would say, be in the world, but don't be of the world. But don't enforce your faith. Don't enforce your values on other people. According to Joshua Landis at the University of Oklahoma, he's over the Middle East program there. He said that most quietist religions declare that it's up to God to punish the sinner, not people, right? So at the judgment day, and it, it's on the judgment judgment day that sins will be punished. Uh, so it's not incumbent on you or me as individuals to enforce our mores, our values on other people. It's up to God. Well, <clears throat> that will change in Islam in the began to change in the 20th century and and change for even and it will metastasize. Uh, by the 21st century. So remember back when we were talking about Egypt um, um, in the 1930s, 1928, 1930s, Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, he becomes very disillusioned with European ideas and institutions, parliamentary democracy that become corrupted. And he looks at it and he looks at all these, these Western influences, theater and modesty, music, all these things that that in his mind were, that were evil, and some of them were, and in, in, in Cairo, and he's looking at it, and he's like, this is wrong. He's looking, and he's seeing how Muslims have gone out of the mainstream of Islam and have become too secular, too worldly. And, and what he wants to do is he's a fundamentalist on the right. So what's he want to do? He, he says, well, I, I, I think we need to go back to the Ummah, back to the Islamic community, back to the Sharia law, back to the authority of the ulama and the religious leaders, and, and, and no more have a secular leader, but to have a leader like Abu Bakr, have someone who leads us, to have a theocracy, right? And the danger came, there were at times when, and he formed the Muslim Brotherhood, and the danger came when they wanted to force it. And the way they would enforce it at times they had a, a confidential arm. That, now, there were some good things that the Muslim Brotherhood did, and I'll talk about that later. But there was an, op, um, uh, um, an al-Nizam al-Khas is what it was called, this special apparatus. There was a secret part of it that was a terrorist part and would enforce uh, their faith, their religion, uh, onto other people. Now, uh, uh, there are two kinds of... Um, ideas in in those in Islam that that want to go back to the fundamentals. Uh, there's the non-militant and the militant. The non-militant are Islamic fundamentalists, uh, fundamentalists whose members they they adopt a adopt a strict implementation of Sharia law, um, the laws that are taught in the Quran and the Hadith, those that were taught by Muhammad and came from uh, Gabriel to Muhammad through the Quran, and and they want to live that, and they but they don't they on the left there the non militant they don't strive to impose it they don't force their ideas on other people, but they use preaching and education and political uh, action. For example, a good example 
This is called Tamkin uh, in Islam. Uh, the people, Alaf Kaf, the people of the caves, they, uh, they went in the caves in Egypt and they just segregated themselves from everybody else so they could get away from the things of the world, from the wickedness that they saw around them. And this kind of separation aims to defend their way of life, their norms and their values. They want to, they want to defend them from the surrounding societies. Now, there were some, though, that would go one step farther, more extreme than the people of the caves. Um, in Avi Melamed's book, Inside Middle East, he calls these extremists Salafi jihadists. Now, Salafi is not necessarily a pejorative term in, in Egypt, but the way he's using it, um, Salaf means in Hebrew, it means ancestors, predecessors, predecessors. So it is often referred to by some Muslims uh, with an honorific expression. Uh, the word for expression is al-salaf al-sali, and it means the pious predecessors. The, the, I, I didn't say that right. The pious predecessors, which is a re what they're referring to is the first generations of Muslims, the Prophet Muhammad and his companions, Abu Bakr and Umar, Uman, and Umar, and so forth. And, um, but taken to the extreme, what, what, uh, what uh, Avi Melamed is calling Salafi jihadists are where they're going way too far to the right. They're becoming so militant, so forceful about their ideas that they create groups like Al-Qaeda, Taliban, ISIS, ISIL, Hamas, Hezbollah, Boko Haram, and, and they, uh, they want to force the caliphate to happen right now. You know, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity once said, the devil always sends errors into the world in pairs of opposites. By the way, this is one of my favorite quotes by him. He relies on your extra dislike of one to draw you gradually into the opposite one. But do not let us be fooled. We have to keep our eyes on the goal and go straight through between both errors. We have no other concern than that with either of them. So the devil would make us dislike a conservative view. So maybe some people are like, you know what? Um, that's too conservative. And, and maybe someone tries to force their conservative views on you and it drives you to the other side, drives you to, could drive some people to the world. This is a guy gambling, surrounded by women and wine and song. Um, but, uh, but conversely, the devil would tempt us, you know, maybe, maybe we look at the things of the world and go like, you know, that's not a good place to be. And, and, and that, and that's okay. But if it drives us so far to the right that we, we not only are against the things of the world, but we try to enforce our beliefs, our values on other people that's when it becomes wrong. And by the way, sometimes, I mean, anybody can become too militant in enforcing their values, their mores on other people. For example, parents can, you know, I've seen parents, I, I think I've been guilty of this, uh, try to um, push my church values on my kids in such a way that, and, and I have to, you have to be careful, I've learned, is you could drive them to the other side if you push too hard. They might push back. And, and sometimes, and, and by the way, I think this is an occupational hazard in all religions, not just Islam. Uh, it's in all religions. And when a person feels or a people feel passionate about their faith, then they become verbally militant towards others. And sometimes uh, uh, it's more than that. Sometimes it's, it's, they try to kill, like in the, the, the Christian um, uh, Inquisition and the Reconquista and the... You know what I mean? Well, that's the devil's strategy, right? To take us to one side or the other instead of staying in the middle. You know, uh, and, and by the way, this idea of going to the right, uh, going extreme, going militant, um, it, it, it didn't start with um, um, Hassan in the 1930s. This goes way, way back. In fact, um, uh, I want to say that it, it, um, there's, a, there's other, there's writings uh, Tamin Ansari in his Destiny Disrupted pointed out um, why did the Mongols and Crusaders crush the Muslims? At least what do the Muslims believe? Um, by the way, this is a history seen through the eyes of Islamic eyes. Th the world, the history of the world is through Islamic eyes. And he says, they had stopped practicing true Islam and God therefore had made them weak. In other words, that's why, the, that's why the, Allah let the Mongols and Crusaders crush them. 
to get back to their victorious ways, Muslims had to go back to the book, purge Islam of all new ideas, interpretations, and innovations. Uh, they must go back to the religious ways of Muhammad and his companions. So this was after that happened. There, there, there were some writers that were saying, this is where we've messed up. We need to go back to the fundamentals. We need to go back to the way it was before. And, and Satan convinced Muslims in the 13th century to move too far to the right by planting ideas in the Muslim eyes, uh, minds that when they were conquered by the Mongols, or crusaders, they they've got to they've got to um, they've got to go back to the fundamentals of Islam, to the Sharia law, and if they have to, they'll they'll enforce it on other people. And writers, some like Tayyamin and and some others, are starting to write about that. Um, but again, Christians did the same thing throughout history: try to enforce their ideas on other people. Now, Hassan al Albana. Uh, as I mentioned, he was the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, and he'll introduce this idea early in the 20th century. And if you recall, Hassan started the Muslim Brotherhood in March 1928, and, and it's a religious and political reform group, and it spreads across Egypt uh, really fast. Um, they even had a kind of YMCA for boys to come. They had all kinds of things uh, uh, they reached out in different ways uh, through um, their medicine and, and, and reaching out people uh, in, in neighborhoods that were poor and they had and no one help people uh, in, uh, feed them. And, and there was just different ways that they, they really, they had a, a, a service arm that uh, the people loved. And uh, by the way, Hassan was a school teacher and, and, he, and he was horrified by the materialism and the decay of Islamic values all around him. <clears throat> and the Muslim brotherhoods, they, they sought to reinstate the former values taught in early Islam, the Sharia law. And they, they focused on education and charitable work, um, but, but also they had, as I mentioned, they had a terrorist arm. Uh, they were disenchanted with uh, President Nasser's um, and and their young off and the young officers their overthrow um, uh, of uh, King Farouk and and they, they they became disenchanted with the Arab nationalistic ideas of Nasser and one of the Muslim Brotherhoods they attempt to assassinate uh, Gamal Nasser the president and uh, and a lot of them get thrown into prison they get tortured and killed and uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood will become very embittered against the government, and eventually the government will execute Hassan in 1948, but a guy named Saeed Qutub uh, will take up the baton of the Muslim Brotherhood. He'll become one of its um, leaders, uh, if not the main leader, and um, he's, an, he's an Egyptian uh, author. He's an educator. Um, he, he wrote like 24 books, 581 articles, uh, very influential, and he promoted a radical hardline uh, ideology. And Qutub became very outspoken and influential. And the government um, gave him a scholarship. They wanted to get rid of him. <laughs> One scholar I heard say they wanted to get rid of him, so they sent him to Greeley, Colorado, wanted to send him to America. They hoped that, he, that that would quash some of the anti-secular and extremist views he had. And, uh, and by the way, so he, he's responsible. Uh, that, that won't work, though, sending him to Colorado, as you know, by watching that video that I had you watch before class. Um, he, he, but he'll become responsible for transforming Islam into a very radical, revolutionary idea. Um, and he interprets, uh, re, I should say, reinterprets key concepts of Islam to kind of fit his revolutionary agenda. Uh, Joshua Landis compares him to Karl Marx, and Karl Marx felt that only communism and revolution could liberate the oppressed from the tyranny of capitalism. And Said Qutub, only through jihad and religious wars, could society be brought back to salvation. So, and again, uh, that image is uh, courteous of Joshua Landis at the University of Oklahoma. I snatched that from him. I hope he doesn't mind. I am giving him the credit, though. So Saeed Qutub is like the right, so how do we, how do we enforce this? 
um, he wanted he, his idea of jihad was to war against non-Muslims. He argued that that was the only way that you could rectify what had gone wrong in the evil world around him in Egypt. And he argued that Muslims should em employ jihad to overthrow the ungodly dictators of the Middle East. And then while nationalism, it'll spread across the Middle, the Middle East, he saw it as a false idol. And the materialism uh, that was all around him, that was coming from the West, that influenced Egypt, Egypt again, he saw it as a kind of false idol of worship. He felt that they needed to go back to the Sharia. He's the Sharia in Arabic just means the road to the watering hole. He saw Muslims had veered off the straight and narrow path. And, and it was only through religious war could Allah pull Muslims back onto the path to live the Sharia. So uh, I had you watch that interesting video on Sayyid and asked you, what, what was it about his visit to America that changed his ideology? How accurate was Sayyid Qutub's view on the morals and the values of Americans? As, as you recall in the video, uh, it was interesting, he became very disenchanted with America's obsession with materialism. Like, uh, for example, there, he looked at them out there mowing their lawn. They, they made their lawns. They manicured them, made them beautiful, and, and their big fancy cars. And uh, I think they showed like a 1958 Chevy in the video. I was kind of enamored with that too. But he was appalled. He goes to a dance at a church, and the young women are, and men are dancing, he said, bosom to bosom. And he said, in kissing, and they were, the women were dressing immodestly. And, and I'll quote him. He said, the American girl is well acquainted with her body's seductive capacity. She knows it lies in the face and in the expressive eyes and thirsty lips. She knows seductiveness lies in the round breasts, the full buttock, buttocks, and in the shapely thighs, sleek legs. And she shows all this and does not hide it. And, and by the way, I think he went to that church dance. And I think what really got him upset is he asked a girl to dance and she said no. And he's like, I hate American girls. <laughs> so he goes back to Egypt he, and, and he angers the Egyptian leaders because he's so conservative and extremist. They throw him into prison. He gets out of prison. So you saw in the video, I saw someone shot in prison and he, it just, he got embittered. And after prison, he sees the secular nationalist regimes, uh, regime of, of his country, but the other Middle East countries as well, is nothing more than a, a cheap imitation of Western imperialism. So he's pondering. He's like, hmm, how would Muhammad deal with this? Well, to convert Arabia to Islam, Muhammad, he thought, hmm, he fought a religious war, a jihad, which means struggle or effort toward a worthy aim or objective. And uh, of course, jihad means different things. Some would say, uh, jihad is a pejorative term here in the West, but some would say it's the struggle, some Muslims, many Muslims would say jihad is a struggle to fight, it's a struggle to fight um, against the evil that's inside of you. We would say as Christians, to fight the natural man that's in me. That's, I have my own little jihad to fight my own little demons and to overcome and conquer and to rise above. Um, extremist radicalists, radicals would say jihad is a struggle to fight, to force your beliefs on other people, to make them be good, to make them, I'll make everybody be good. Boy, that sure sounds like a satanic. Uh, rob them of their free agency, take away their agency, make them be good, right? Uh, well, um, it, it, as you, if you recall, uh, remember Muhammad went in when he went back and went into um, went back to Mecca. He went into the Kaaba and he destroyed, um, uh, smashed all 360 idols, and that's a lot of smashing. And uh, and and so Qutub's like, that's what I need to do. I need I need to smash secularism, materialism, and Western values. And by the way, I think Muhammad, if he saw what Qutub of his philosophy, he would say this, I think he would roll over in his grave. Uh, uh, this is not, he would like, this is not the way. This is not what I was teaching. I was fighting against idols. I didn't kill people for it. Um, I didn't enforce my faith. Um, 
<clears throat> so what does he call, so what, what Katub calls um, uh, people that, um, that who he sees as apostatized from Islam, he, it's called takfir in Arabic. And it means to declare someone as an unbeliever. And a, what we would say maybe in our own faith uh, in the church is an apostate. And uh, those who leave the church can't leave the church alone. And they sometimes become more, more wicked uh, than they were before they ever left. But, but he's saying they are bad, bad. He, he believed that most Muslims were not really Muslims. Uh, they're apostates. Therefore, he said, we can kill them. It's okay. Um, and and that, is, that is at the core of his radical message that let's kill them. And you see, this is what's changing in the 1960s. Here, here's Katub's ideologies, four principles that he taught. Make sure Sharia is the one and the only law. Toppling any regime that does not implement uh, Sharia law, it's okay. Proactively and violently create a global caliphate. Unwaveringly oppose Western values. And, uh, and then eliminate the state of Israel and all Jews. Now, um, uh, why would people go follow that kind of ideology uh, in any country? Why would they? And it's because that if you look at, um, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood really is a two-sided coin. It had a service side, uh, as I mentioned, um, like educational, social, welfare initiatives, but it also had a terrorist side. And uh, today, most Muslim Brotherhoods are on the left. They're, they, they've gotten rid of the terrorist side. But there are those extremists out there. So, uh, Hamas uh, is a break off. Hamas, the uh, terrorist wing. Um, but they, in, in Palestine, they also have a, a service wing, educational, social welfare initiatives as, as well. But they also have an extremist part. So, But... Um, I guess what I'm saying is, why would people, I was back to the question, um, why would people buy into this radical um, ideology and, and buy into some of these terrorist groups? And that is because these terrorist groups had that one side of the coin where they reached out to people and to help people. And in a country where you're starving to death, um, where uh, corruption is rampant, like, for example, in Yemen, the people, cholera is just, people are dying, hundreds dying every day because the country is just suffering so much. And, and that just creates this chaos for um, uh, extremists to go in and to help. They reach out and help, and the people are like, oh, you help, you help me live. I remember when I was on my mission uh, for a church um, in Washington, Seattle, this lady that I taught, her name was Ursula, and she had been through World War II. And um, I loved her. I got very close to her and her daughter. Uh, and I remember one time I, we were talking about Germany and the war, and she was telling me stories about it. And I made a, kind of an off-color statement about um, Hitler. And oh, my goodness. And by the way, she'd only been in America for two years. She barely spoke English. And I uh, loved her, though. She, I called her Oma. That's German for grandma. And I, I thought she was going to bite my head off. She said, when we were in Germany, she, she goes, and it was between World War One and World War Two. After you know the Allies went in and destroyed Germany in World War One, uh, we didn't rebuild it, and we just left it, left it, and the people, and they oh, made the people pay millions of dollars of government, and uh, and they were just in so much debt, and their people were starving, and Hitler came along, and he lifted these people out of the dust, lifted them out of the dirt, and he started to feed them. And she said, we were starving. He fed us. And, and, and she, she remembers just starving as a child. And then she remembers when he, his regime came along, that's when he lifted them out of the dust and they became a, a very powerful nation and a very wealthy nation. And she said, I remember eating food. And so I never forgot that. So I'm not justifying, uh, I certainly am not justifying the Nazis for the horrific crimes that they created and the evil and all that they did. But what I'm saying is you can see that when, why would people adopt a terrorist group or a Nazi group? Well, if there's a, a side to them that 
that helps and reaches out, the people might turn a, a blind eye to that other side, especially if they're starving to death. People do crazy things when they're hungry. Well, when Nasser lost face uh, in the Six-Day War, you know, remember the, the Israelis just took out his whole air force in one day? The Muslim brother metastasized. Um, the organization itself thrust beyond the borders of Egypt into Syria, Jordan, and the Arab Emirates and the rest of the Arab uh, heartland. And uh, Mir Tamim goes on to say, what more? The original movement began sprouting offshoots, each one more radical than the last. One such branch was Egypt's Islamic Jihad, founded by a man named Al-Zawahiri, who in turn mentored the now infamous Saudi jihadist Osama bin Laden. So, and, and again, it's this Takfir ideology. In the 1960s, this Islamic fundamentalism uh, will, will morph into this group that we, we might call Takfir wa Ahidra, excommunication and the migration. Uh, violence and terrorism, are st uh, they now are, are seen as a, a means to purify the takfir, purify the infected Islam. So not only are infidels crossed out or considered evil, but takfir ideology, uh, it's an extreme school of thought that starts to, to metastasize in the 1960s that not only wants to exterminate non-Muslim infidels, uh, who claim to be Muslims, but also it'll it'll uh, take Muslims themselves who claim to be Muslims. I think I said that wrong. Uh, not only will it take out infidels like us, us in the West, but it will also people who claim to be Muslims, if they're apostate, if like a secularist like Nasser, Qutub would say, you are takfir. And he believed that he believed really that most Muslims were not really Muslims; they're apostates. Therefore, we can kill them. And and this is at the core of his message. He takes Islam away from quietism, where you let people live their own lives, um, sinful or holy, and he wants to enforce um, Sharia law uh, values and standards on others. And instead of Allah deciding on judgment day, who's right and who's wrong, Qutub says we're responsible to help Allah, to help God make that judgment now against unbelievers. These infected Muslims, these takfir, uh, they're the worst enemies of Islam, he thought, whose danger is even greater than that of non-Muslims, even that of the, non of the infidels. And these Muslim infidels corrupt Islam and its value from within. So you can see right here in this video, these, this is um, ISIS killing their own people, their own Muslim people. And, uh, and, uh, and, and many people idolize Qutub. Um, uh, but here in the West, we, we consider him the father of radical extremists. Um, yeah, but ultra conservative radicals to say, now nah, he's cool. Um, he will influence Al-Zawahir on the right there, and Al-Zawahir is the one that will um, join uh, ranks with Osama bin Laden eventually, and we'll talk more about both of them next time, um, but uh, th this is where it goes. And as you can see, what's wrong with, with veering off the mainstream? Well, uh, it just gets worse and worse if left unchecked, if left out of control. That's the danger of going too far back to fundamentalists. And by the way, um, I want to point out that there were other, not just Qutub, uh, Saeed Qutub, but there are others like that influenced um, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, like these um, books right here. They added to the ideology. Uh, let me just say something you guys read in the pre-class um, reading by uh, Avi Melamed about political Islam versus militant Islam. Um, political Islam, Tom Ken, as it said in Arabic, uh, political Islam, it wants to lay the foundations for a future global caliphate, but Taqwin, uh, it wants to, it wants to enforce it. It wants it now, right? And that's really the core difference between, uh, uh the two. And, and, and that's why, and that's what will happen in 2014 when Abu Baker will stand up and declare himself, uh, the new caliph and he'll, in northern Syria, and he'll want to create the new caliphate. Um, 
and he wants to create an Islamic state and, and, and enforce it. And, uh, well, if we were together, I, I, would, I would love to ask you guys, so up to this point, because we're not in class, can't do this, but the most interesting thing I learned from my reading, from the videos I had you watch, and what I don't understand, well, I wish I could be with you, and I will look at your questions, your pre-class, the questions you submitted. Um, and I asked you, one of the videos I had you watch is the one on Wahhabism, and how does its ideology influence Sunni terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda, Taliban, ISIS? Remember uh, Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab? He, he lived back in the 1700s. He was a religious leader, if you recall, and a theologian. He was from the Naj in Central Arabia, and he founded the movement called the Wahhabis. And uh, Wahhab charted the religio-political pact with Muhammad bin Saud, who, if I remember, is not mistaken, is the father of Ibn Saud, who is the who Saudi Arabia is named after, and he will help. Um, Muhammad bin Saud and Wahhab will join. Wahhab is a religious leader, so he'll give Muhammad bin Saud, who's kind of the sheikh, the emir, he'll give him the legitimacy because he's a religious person and, and a lot of people followed him. And that's how um, uh, Muhammad bin Saud will establish the emirate of uh, Dariya, the first Saudi state. Um, but, but Wahhab... Uh, his ideology, which was very extreme, in fact, the first community he lived in will kick him out because he asks to, uh, he wants to stone a woman for committing adultery. And the, and the villager like, you know what, you're psycho, get out. And so uh, that's when later he'll meet up with um, uh, Muhammad bin Saud. But uh, his ideologies will remain in Saudi Arabia. They will influence radical hardliners like Osama bin Laden, who held from Saudi. And, and I have to say, uh, the, the, uh, the royal family in Saudi Arabia is really trying to get away from this. And they're really trying, uh, recently they've, they've allowed women to, to be able to start driving. They've allowed theaters. Um, if, you, if you've watched the movie Wajda, I had you guys watch it for extra credit. And you see how the Wahhabi influence on the people um, is still in effect. So, so which countries did Al-Qaeda and ISIS ideologies originate? Well, you look right here. So Qutub and Hassan, that's where some originated in Egypt. And then you have Wahhabism in Saudi Arabia. And this isn't the only places, but these are the main, uh, this is the main sources for the ingredients of this Salafi jihadist, this extreme um, ideology that will influence Al-Qaeda and um, ISIS and others. So as you can see, all three of their ideologies make a really bad formula, right? And this formula will influence many um, terrorist groups, whether ISIS or Taliban, it's just very, very destructive. Well, militant Islam, here, let me just, just review. Here's what they want. Here's their agenda. Here's their objective. Establish a global caliphate enforced the strict interpretation of Sharia law. Uh, for example, women, women's head faces need to be covered. Uh, overthrow all current political structures in the Muslim world. Teach violence is justified, even critical. Wage war on the West. Wage war on the Jews. Wage war on Shiites. Now, now that last part, that, that won't emerge. That, that's ISIS. That's not Al-Qaeda. That will come with Zarqawi. Uh, after uh, 2003 in Iraq, and and they'll encourage martyrdom. In fact, uh, they'll encourage it. It's called Tab a Shahada. More noble than living a fulfilling life is establishing Islam over the human race. That's what Tab a Shahada means. That Muslims should not only be willing to die for Allah, but want to die for Allah. Remember the, the Al-Qaeda magazine? This guy, it's believed, is behind that magazine. Uh, he's the mastermind behind it. And here's one of his statements. The killing of women and children as well as the use of weapons of mass destruction is legitimate and justified. Ah, that's so sad. Well, if we were together, I'd, I'd have you answer this question. I had you read Avi Melamed's uh, um, chapter, what is, and then ask you, what is the relationship between chaos and terrorism? And his point was that what's happening in these Middle East countries is when you have poverty and you have corruption and you have 
that leads to chaos, that's where terrorism, it just, it's, a, it's a petri dish that breeds, or you could say another metaphor, it creates a vacuum for, destroys, this chaos destroys um, the structure of the government and so forth and creates a vacuum for evil to come in and, uh, and take over. Chaos in the Arab world is what caused the Arab awakening and the Arab awakening in turn generates chaos. And chaos is the strategies, strategic ally of bin Laden and those who succeed him. Well, how did terrorist groups like ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra, al-Qaeda, where do they come up? How do they justify what they're doing? Well, they use scripture. Um, for example, uh, in, uh, in uh, Surah 4, verse 76, the believers fight in the way of God and the unbelievers fight in the idol's way. Fight you, therefore, against the friends of Satan. Or if you encounter this to believers in a battle, strike off their heads. That's why the ISIS and the is so into cutting off heads. It, that's part of, part of it right there. Uh, slay the idolatrous wherever you find them. Take them captives. Besiege them. Ambush them. If they repent and keep up prayer and pay the poor rate, leave their way to free them. Surely is Allah is forgiving. By the way, uh, interesting, even if a person repents to an ISIS al-Qaeda member, uh, like the Jordanian fi fighter pilot, they would never, they would, I'm not saying he repented, but uh, he, he would ask for, you know, for, you know, Allah for forgiveness. It, whatever, I, no matter what, they, they will not, they will not, they don't, they take that last part of the verse and just throw it out, is what I'm saying. They proof text that first part. So I'm saying that even if that Jordanian fighter pilot had said, oh, forgive me, they'd be like, I don't care. Slay them wherever you catch them. The sin of disbelief is greater than committing murder. Whoa. So um, again, um, uh, you got to look at the context there, right? If you go to the Quran and read it, look at the context, what it was about. Uh, that's not what Muhammad was teaching, to kill everybody, all the infidels, and all those that struggle in their belief. Um, and, but this ideology will pull foreigners when the war breaks out in Syria uh, it will bring foreign fighters. When the Shiites come in uh, from Iran to fight in Syria, uh, the Sunni Muslims will come from all over the world to fight against the Shiites. Shiites like Hezbollah and the IRG. And you can see where a lot of the foreign fighters here are coming from around the world that came to Syria to fight. Interesting, uh, my question is, why Belgium, Denmark, and France? I used to know why France. I had a good reason for it, but now I can't remember. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this movie, um, uh, Cyber Jihad. I just showed you one little clip from it, but it was so interesting to see ISIS's marketing strategy and the, how, how, why the ISIS hashtags outperform Al Qaeda's on social media and how they created that program that would just keep bringing up um, ISIS propaganda uh, on, your, um, on your personal device, digital device. And, uh, well, I'm going to close with this. You know, um, in our own church, um, I, I, by showing this picture, I have to be careful because I'm not in any means saying that the polygamists on the right, the fundamentalists, are evil and are killing people. And I'm not saying that the, the um, uh, ordained women movement, uh, women wanting the priests on the left, that they're killing. That. Please don't, don't get me wrong there. Um, but I'm saying that spiritually speaking, I have to be careful because we've seen people leave the, our church, the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, because they, they'll go to either too far to the right or too far to the left. And the safest place to be is always in the middle. I bear testimony to you that these men are prophets and apostles. They are men of God, and they are men that will teach us how to stay in the middle. And that's where virtue is. In fact, I love this, that virtue is a mean. Aristotle taught this. It's a mean between two extremes, each of which is a vice. For example, the act of giving too much money or uh, the good action would be to give the right amount, which lies between giving too much on one hand or not giving enough on the other. He would say the midpoint is the golden mean, right? Well, in conclusion, stay in the middle. And, and I know these terrorist groups, sometimes it gets really, really scary. But um, 
Don't worry, brothers and sisters. You know, I was speaking at a youth conference many years ago in Eugene, Oregon, and there was a girl there at the conference that was on crutches. And, and I said, um, uh, what happened to your leg? And she said, I got shot. And I'm like, what? She says, yeah, um, a bullet um, went through my best friend and lodged in my leg. I'm like, what? And come to find out, she says, you don't know about what happened here? And I'm like, no. Just prior to this, like earlier that week, um, a, a kid named Kip Kinkle went into Thurston High School, opened fire and, and killed a bunch of kids in the cafeteria. And luckily, a bunch of kids, a, a wrestler jumped on him, knocked him down. Other kids jumped on him. They stopped the kid. And, uh, but he did kill a few. And, uh, and so I'm with these kids at this youth conference. We, uh, the, the high school principal called our church and asked us if we would come help up clean up after the reporters. I guess the reporters came from all the United States and they left their, you know, Taco Bell, McDonald's wrappers all over. So that's what we did for a service project at the youth conference. And I was just one of the speakers. I was sent there by BYU. And if you look along the, this fence, this fence just went along the whole entire school. People had sent stuff from all over the world. A memor- it was, this became the memorial. And the, and the, and the student body uh, officers who were there to instruct us, they said, clean up everything, but leave the fence alone. We'll take care of that later. So they left it there. So as I'm walking around with these kids and talking with them, they're telling me about, um, I'm asking them questions as we're cleaning up. And I'm coming to find out that, that all of them except for three of them were not at the cafeteria before school started eating breakfast with everybody else. And I'm like, why not? And, and, and uh, they all had, well, most of them were in seminary, but seminary was supposed, to be, was supposed to end and they were supposed to go to the cafeteria. But what I found out is that the teacher went over. They said, yeah, he went over his lesson. He never, in three years, I've had him for three years, he's never went over. He went over and his lesson was so spiritual. We all stayed after because we wanted to talk to him because we wanted to know about, what he, uh, about this more what he was teaching. And, and then one kid told me, oh, I, w- I went and got donuts for everybody at the seminary, so I wasn't there. Another kid said, I just stayed home from school. I don't know why. My mom, I could be on my sick bed, my deathbed, and she wouldn't let me stay home. But that day I said, Mom, I don't feel like going to school. And she said, okay. And they all had an excuse why they weren't there in that cafeteria. There was three that were there. One of them was sloughing seminary. I'd always tell my kids, don't slough seminary. <laughs> it's the safest place you could be. And really that's true. Anytime you're in the presence of the Lord, um, you're in a safe place. You know, in section 45, where it talks about all the, the calamities and the destruction that'll come in the last days, scourges, earthquakes, vapors of fire and desolation. In the middle of all that scariness, the Lord says, but my disciples, this is DNC 45, verse 32, but my disciples shall stand in holy places and shall not be moved. But among the wicked, men shall lift up their voices and curse God and die. Um, I love that place stand in a holy place. The Institute Manual has a great insight. It says, um, a holy place that has more to do with how one lives, not where they live. A holy place is any place you can enjoy the spirit and the presence of the Lord. I bear testimony to you. Stay close to the Lord Jesus Christ. Stay close to our Father in heaven because a holy place as you do, you'll, it doesn't, you don't have to be in a temple or a church, but as you have the Spirit with you wherever you stand, you'll be in a holy place, you'll be in a safe place. And I realized that day those kids were in holy places because the Spirit was with them, whether it took them to Dunkin' Donuts or whether it kept them in seminary longer than they, than they anticipated. They were safe. And I know we'll lose a few people here and there in the last days, but for the most part, God will protect His people and don't worry. He loves you. He's with you. I bear witness to that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.